Scar and Violet have been out for quite a while now, and most people are aware of the proper route to proceed through this game. I, on the other hand, do not. Why start a journey by taking on Katie and her team of bug Pokemon? We could just make your way all the way Glaciado to take on Grusha and her team of ice Pokemon instead. With this being an open world game, the options for proceeding through the game are just endless. But I'm going to do something a little bit strange this time around. I'm going to take on the Paldea region in reverse order, and not only that, I'm going to do it with only purple Pokemon. Can we actually do this though? Let's find out. To start, we customize our character by giving him a fitting name before heading out into the world of Pokemon. Why does Pokemon make our moms so hot nowadays? Like, keep your eyes off her man, she's mine. Well, she's, she's my mom. You know what I mean, okay? You get it. But now we finally get the option to choose our starter. Looking at these choices here, none of them are viable options. But we do have to choose one of these. So who can turn down a slick hairdo like this? Come on Quaxley, uh, let's give you a good name though. How about Placeholder? Cause that's really what you're gonna be for now. Oh, come on game, why are you doing this to me? First, you give me a hot mom, and then you give me this? Were they introduced to pneumonia? <coughs> Wait, no that's not right. Nimona. So, wanna be friends? You just stole my awesome fire croc. No, we cannot be friends. On a side note though, do you think this croc still likes water? Will I leave Nimona mourning the loss for a new fire friend? Let me explain a couple of caveats to this challenge. Since we're working with level caps, this means that Pokemon that we use to beat the first gym will likely be too overleveled to take on the next gym since the level cap actually gets lower with each badge instead of higher. Sure, I could go grind up a team of all-stars to destroy the first gym, but this would leave me with severely limited options for the gyms later on in this challenge. I'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along, but for now, we should probably start adding some Pokemon to the team. On Poco Path, we come across the first victim of our challenge. Despite looking purple, Lechonk here is actually categorized as black. So it's not exactly going to be useful in this challenge, but you know the rules of the challenge, so we do have to give this one a name as well. Perfect. Hey, you're getting the hang of catching Pokemon. Wait, I've literally caught a single Lechonk and that's it. Hey, a purple Pokemon, finally. Pokeball, go. Wait, no, I didn't ask for this. After realizing that yes means yes and no also means yes, I made my way back to the lab where I'm introduced to the one character in this game that actually has a decent backstory. After only like 5 seconds of knowing us, Arvin surrenders a ball containing a legendary Pokemon to us like a box full of old Pokemon cards back in the early 2000s. With this in our possession, we're finally ready to take on the world. Actually wait, not quite yet. There we go, much better. Oh, hey Nimona, are you here to just get stomped on again? Huh, didn't see that one coming. But hey, I don't have any purple Pokemon on my team yet, so this one technically doesn't count, right? I get no Okay, just rub it in, why don't you? Huh, look at these losers. Ah, oh, she'll be fine. We won't worry about her for the time being. Dang. Okay, that is actually a sweet pose. And I know what you're all thinking. How can you beat Team Skull though? This. This is how. And literally, literally anything else. Okay, Team Skull was by far the worst criminal organization in all of Pokemon. I can't believe him. After wiping the floor with the recruitment officers, Nimona gives us with the Terror Orb, which we immediately chuck into the trash where it actually belongs. What do we look like, a bunch of cheaters? And then we're finally introduced to this fantastic display of graphics, before obtaining our three major quests for the challenge. Cassiopeia's request to destroy Team Star, Arvin's request to find some dank weed, and then our main quest of this challenge, defeating all the gym leaders. What kind of maniac just says yes? Yes. Okay, for the 10th time, I'm not getting into bed with you. Then why did you bring me into my room and just talk about my bed the entire time? I literally followed you into your room and haven't said a single word. Why don't you just go take on the bug gym? What, like a noob? No, we have bigger fish to fry, and I don't mean you. With our team still lacking any purple, we set out to fix that issue by making our way to the West Providence Area 1 to find the first encounter. This is the home of Mistrevious, who I capture and named Violet, and I'm pretty sure you can guess what the naming scheme is going to be going forward. Violet has a sassy nature, so minus speed and plus special defense, which I'm not going to lie might be one of the worst natures for this Pokemon. While wandering a bit too far north, we run into this strange man named Clive, who tells us about the team star base that lies just ahead. Hey old man, just leave us alone. I have gyms to beat first, okay? I'll get back to this later. But before I get too far into this, I head into... But before getting too far into this, I make my way to- <sighs> As I make my way back down the path, I stop by this random picnicker to obtain some important ingredients for the next step of our journey. I'm honestly surprised that this guy doesn't have any Herba Mystica on him if you know what I mean. On the way back south, I run into Rookie D, that I catch a name Perpies. Yeah, I know, really clever. It too has a minus speed nature, which will definitely not have any negative consequences in the future. 
Before getting too deep into this challenge, there's a glaring issue here that we really need to address. Yeah, Maridon, I'm looking at you. While I was traveling through these bluffs, I was hearing a strange sound off in the distance. After absolutely destroying the crab and watching it go Kaioken times 4 on my ass, Arvin arrives just in the nick of time and offers his shoulder as a meat shield as Mistrevious just slowly takes it down. As the titan falls, we get our hands on some dank herbs which we will totally not finish off in one sitting. Wait, did you just give some to the dog? Oh, thank god. With this titan beat, Maridon now has the ability to dash which is going to make traveling around the region so much faster. Wasting no time at all, I grab myself a grimer named Jam before becoming part of a bad game of pinball until I arrive at the top of the slope where I find the culprit. Bombardier is strong and thanks to grimer knowing the move toxic, I could just poison- Wait, what? So I guess something I forgot to mention was that without any badges, Pokemon caught above level 25 will not always obey us. This does actually apply to Pokemon caught below the level though as they're going to continue to listen to us even after passing this obedience cap. This severely limits the Pokemon that we're going to be able to use for the first gym since many of the purple Pokemon available in this game are only available above that level 25 cap. But luckily for me, Grimer eventually gets off a of Toxic, which slowly chips away at the giant bird until it too eventually goes down. Still a little bit loopy from the last time around, Arvin wastes no time sampling this illicit substance and giving in to peer pressure, I decide to partake as well. Dude, can you just imagine the time where Pokemon are just like, machines? How crazy would that be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, stupid bird. With Bombardier taken down, Maridon gains the ability to swim, which would have been nice about an hour ago. You live and you learn, right? With Maridon upgraded, it was time to start grinding up some levels for once. But there is one problem that I need to take care of first. With all these open slots in my party, I would just be wasting the experience thanks to the passive EXP gain in this game. So I head back out into the wilderness to add a few more members to the team. Ghastly, Sableye, Grumpig and Noibat are all quickly added to the team, but with Noibat's evolution not coming until level 50, which is well over the obedience level cap, it's going to be useless, so straight into the box it goes. I also grab myself a Gumi at South Providence Area 4, which I cleverly named Purple Goo, and this is going to be one major addition to the team. Our journey then brings us to Montanerva, and no, we're not here to take on any gyms yet, are you crazy? We're here for another reason. Hidden around the map are numerous evolution items, and it is here where I can grab myself a Dusk Stone to evolve Mistrevious into Miss Magius. With access to Mystical Fire, Miss Magius is going to be a great counter to Grusha's team of Ice Pokemon, but Miss Magius is rather frail, so we'll have to do everything we can to ensure that this thing hits like an absolute tank. After grabbing the Power Lens from Deadly Bird Presence, it was on to decimating the local duck population in order to gain some special attack EVs. Shield your eyes, Quaxley! You don't need to see this! After picking Quaxley up from his weekly therapy session, we make our way north through Lavincia until we- Uh, where can I find the protein shakes and testosterone? Why are you asking me? Just smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. North of town, we have one more vital task that I think we really need to complete. Oi. Orthworm is a beast. With an incredible 145 base defense, this thing is an absolute tank. Maybe a phallic tank, but a tank nonetheless. Where it excels in defense, it actually lacks in special defense. So I send out Miss Magius to burn it to the ground with a super effective mystical fight. Crap. Okay, I haven't taught it that yet. Well, luckily for me, Confuse Ray lands and Miss Magius gets off a side beam before finally going down. As Noibat comes out, Orthworm can't even stand the sight of it. So instead, it chooses to just take its own life instead of continuing on with this fight. Okay, I'm not going to lie, Noibat. This might be the most useful that you're going to be throughout this entire run. Near the Team Star Fairy Base, you can find this meadow here. And if you didn't know, this middle plays a very important role in this game. Thanks to having no badges up until this point, we have very limited access to ingredients for making sandwiches. But luckily for me, there's still one recipe that will come in handy even early in the game. The ham sandwich. This simple dish boosts the spawn of normal type Pokemon. And thanks to Chansey and Blissey being the only normal spawns in this area, you can only imagine how often they're going to be popping up here. After two straight hours of listening to this, we were finally approaching the level cap of 48 and we're ready to take on the first gym of the challenge. As we enter the gym, we're greeted by Nimona who gives us a few gifts for this challenge. Super potions? You know my Pokemon are like level 46 now, right? Wait, they're what level? Uh, don't worry about it, thanks. After getting a new record time in Tiny Toons Olympics downhill skiing, it was time to take on Grusha herself. She leads off with Frostmoth and I send out Miss Magius. Oh, I also forgot to mention that while in Lavincia, I stopped by the shop to grab myself a metronome which is a held item that boosts the power of an attack by 20% with each successive use. With this attached to Miss Magius, Power Gem will become even more deadly as time goes on. 
Both Frostmoth and Beartick go down the power gem without dealing a single point of damage. Then comes this beast. Sea Titan tanks the shot from power gem before dealing a devastating blow with Grusha's signature move, Ice Spinner. One more shot takes it out, but Miss Magius is now at low health as Grusha's final Pokemon, Altaria, comes out. It terrestrializes into a mono ice type, which removes its quad weakness to rock, allowing it to survive a massive blow from Power Gem. Just like Hurricane Ian, Altaria destroys Miss Magius, and without a backup plan, yeah, this battle was over. You know what they say, okay? Insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Hi, I'm insane. Suck it, game. With this first badge under our belt, Pokemon caught up to level 25 are now going to obey me, which gives me a few more options going forward. But now that this gym is done, we have to send Miss Magius to the box until later on in this run. Luckily, while going through all the training earlier, Rookie D evolved into Corvusquire and finally into Corviknight. Ghastly wasn't that far behind as it evolved into Haunter, which will sadly be the final evolution for it in this run since I'm unable to trade it to get Gengar. Well, I found out after the fact that I could have actually just caught a Pinkerchin and traded it for Gengar, but that's a different story. After scouring the ruins to find Spiritomb, I head back into the desert, and I avoid drowning this time around, to take on the giant threat that's just looming around. Although Iron Treads gave me a lot of trouble in the first run through this game, it went down surprisingly easy thanks to Miss Magius' Mystical Fire. No, okay, I'm done sharing my sandwiches with you. Get your own! Okay, fine. Who could turn down a face like that? I'm sorry, bud. One like equals one sandwich for Maridon. Feeling unstoppable, I head straight to Casaroya Lake to take on the next Titan, the False Dragon Titan, Dundozo. And let me tell you, I got wrecked. I might just have to come back to this one a little bit later on. Before leaving the area, I make sure to grab a Swalot named Deez Nuts, cause who can pass up on that opportunity? Before heading south to take on the next gym of our journey. Tulip specializes in psychic Pokemon, but thanks to any Pokemon over level 25 not obeying me, we have very limited options going into this battle, but I was still able to come up with a plan. After grinding Corviknight's attack and special defense EVs to the max, I stop by Delibird Presence to grab another important item for this challenge. Leftovers. This is a strategy that I've used in multiple challenge runs so far, which I term the Protect and Eat strat. You might be asking, what's that? Well, let's just see it in action. Tulip leads to the Frigoraph, and I send out Corviknight. Looking at its moveset, this is the combination that I came up with. Home Claws will boost its attack and accuracy by one stage each, which will pair nicely with Power Trip, a 20 base power attacking move that gains 20 more power for every stat stage increase on the Pokemon. Pair this with using Protect every other turn to allow for leftovers recovery, and next thing you know, Corviknight has a 260 power super effective attack with plenty of health to spare. There is another problem though. Corviknight, with its minus speed nature, is extremely slow. To account for this, I continue to use Protect on turn 1 to recover some health before taking the opponent out. Both Espartha and Gardevoir land some big hits before going down, leaving us at low health as Florgas comes out and terrestrializes into a Psychic type. Protect allows for a little bit more passive recovery, but then Florgas goes for Moonblast. Oh, thank god. With one more blow, Florgas goes down and we've earned the second gym badge of our journey. And now you might be asking again, Foss. Why didn't you just bring Corviknight up to level 45 before taking that gym on? Well, this is why. Montanerva is the location of the next gym, which happens to have ghost types. And what do you know? Ghost types are also weak to dark. Therefore allowing me to resort to my same strategy this time around. Rhyme's gym actually consists of double battles, which means, hi. Holy shit, lady, don't scare me like that. Ha, caught you off guard. Now let's battle. After witnessing another massacre at the hands of Rhyme this time, it was time to take her on. I'm not gonna lie, besides Corviknight, the remainder of the team was pretty much there just as cannon fodder. After boosting my attack and accuracy along with some random boosts from the crowd as well, Power Trip had more than enough power to take out each and every one of Rhyme's Pokemon with a single shot each to earn us one of the easiest badges yet. The problem with using a team of only purple Pokemon is that many of these Pokemon just have the same typings, and we all know that the key to a solid team is variety. So there's one Pokemon that I'm hoping to get my hands on that's going to help with those lower level gyms in this challenge. In South Providence Area 4, you can find Toxel, a poison electric Pokemon which could be a super valuable addition to the team. But the problem is finding one that's at a low enough level to take on the second to the last gym of this challenge, which has a level cap of 17. After a bit of searching, I figured I could just boost my odds to the use of a new mechanic added to these games. Recipe boosts. After running to a local store to enjoy a little snack, I was finally ready to find this little- Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Dude, no way. It's a purple shiny. Oh my God. Wait, can we catch this thing? Gotta save it first. Let's go. That's all I need. Thank you. 
On a side note, 500 likes and I trade this to a random stranger. Why do I wish this upon myself? Oh, and I also caught a Toxel. Yay. I also take the time to grab an Eevee while I'm here, which isn't purple at the moment, but it will be soon enough. It has an impish nature, which is probably one of the worst natures for it, but it does have the adaptability ability. That's a weird one to say, which is actually quite clutch. I also came across one of the new additions to the Pokédex, Charcadet, which despite being really cool looking, is rather useless at this time. So it's just going to spend this time on the sidelines for now. With the normal gym up next, and after getting a little taste of purple shiny Pokémon, I was determined to catch one more. I began dabbling in the art of sandwich making yet again in the hopes to find myself a shiny Makuhita, but after hours of searching, I came up empty. Broken hearted, I made my way back to... Oh, a Sinistee. That'll work. But before Sinistees can be of any use, we're going to have to evolve it first. To do so, we're going to need to find a specific item. After stealing this man's wallet to feed my addiction for dank weed, we finally acquired the option to participate in auctions. After selling nearly everything I own, I dropped way too much money on a chipped pot. This will be all worth it though, because thanks to this item, Sinistee can evolve into... Wait, what? You have to be kidding me. After wasting way too much time and some of my sanity, I head north of Casaroya Lake where I come across the actual item needed for the situation, the Cracked Pot. With this, Sinistee evolves into Poltegeist, and it was now time to take on Larry and his team of normal Pokemon. After choosing the dish of a Master Chef, wait, where'd they go? Did you just crush them? Larry leads with Kamala, and I send out Poltegeist. Looking at Kamala's moveset, it doesn't have any attacking moves that can actually land, which gives me plenty of time to set up Calm Minds to max out our special attack. It does bore us to sleep a time or two, but Sinistee eventually wakes up to drop it with a single Giga Drain. The story is much the same for the Dadun Sparse and Star Raptor that we're out next, earning us yet another easy badge thanks to our high IQ plays. Now is the true reason why I want an electric type Pokemon on my team. But before I get into that, I swing by the beach to grab myself a Pinkerchin. Which, by the way, how is this thing purple but Lechonk is not? Okay, riddle me that. I then head back to Las Plados where I destroy so many Psyduck that I actually resort to fighting just parts of them instead. After all this grinding, Mareep evolves into Flaffy, and then eventually into Ampharos at level 30. Thanks to the 30 plus Psyduck and Fletchling that we took out, Glitter's EVs are now maxed in special attack and speed, which should give us a big advantage going forward. In addition to that, I also gave Ampharos the Metronome to boost its attack with each subsequent use. And honestly, this is probably just overkill. Kofu's team of water Pokemon get absolutely destroyed by a stab boosted, super effective Thunderbolt which drops each of his Pokemon with just a single shot each. <laughs> your team is absolutely pathetic. I can't even imagine losing a battle that bad. Hey, let's have another battle. It'll be fun. I'm gonna have to go with no. You knew about this, didn't you? Thankfully, this is another battle that we don't actually have to win. So despite this absolute beatdown, we're moving on. Wait, what's that sound? Next up on America's Worst Content Creators is Foss. Whoa, I love this show. I can't believe I get to be... Wait, you son of a bitch. And it's at this point in the video that we search out the most important parts of YouTube analytics. We find where you like the video, subscribe for more content, and then finally, we find where you leave a comment below telling me just how bad this gag actually is. On a side note, if this video gets a thousand views in the first week, I'll do a live stream in an Iona costume. Because I know that's what you all want to see, right? I own this team consists of electric Pokemon, and thanks to the Pinkerton that I recently picked up having the Lightning Rod ability, I choose to lead with this and just hope for the best. I go for Charge on turn 1 just to get that special defense boost, and like Clockwork, Watchroll goes for Spark just to boost my special attack thanks to our ability. After a few more special defense boosts thanks to Charge, Pinkerton takes it out with a Spark to bring out Luxio instead. Despite having boosted special defense, Luxio resorts to the use of a physical move, Bite, which brings Pinkerchin down to low health before it eventually takes it out with Chilling Water. With only a little HP remaining, we don't stand much of a chance against this obese frog that's out next. Chilling Water takes it down to about half HP before it hands us yet another L. I try a different strategy next time around by coming into battle with a bit more experience, which allows Pinkerton to level up and learn Bubble Beam after taking a Watch Roll. Thanks to the Metronome Held item, Bubble Beam is all the way at 2 times its base power by the time we've reached Iona's final Pokemon, Miss Magius. But it just outspeeds and hits Pinkerton with a Confuse Ray, causing Pinkerton to just hit itself in Confusion on the next turn and eventually leads to our downfall. But by this time, I know that her final two Pokemon will just resort to special attacks. So I replace Metronome with Leftovers, and I instead spend the time to maximize my special defense before taking out the Electric Bird. Luxio goes down to a couple Bubble Beams without dealing much damage in return. Then check this out. Thanks to my boosted special defense and Leftovers item, Pinkerton is actually gaining more HP than it's losing after each hit from Belly Bolt. 
This allows me to slowly chip away until Miss Magius is all that remains. Much like last time, it lands a confuse rate that results in Pinkerton hitting itself. But even a boosted hex does minimal damage. So after a few more turns, Pinkerton has finally fought through the confusion enough to earn us yet another victory. Hey, you stop that. Not yet. With only two gym badges remaining, there really isn't a whole lot more to do other than plan out the teams going forward. Next up is the Grass Gym, so yep, you guessed it, Charconet, you're up. After destroying a handful of teapots over by Lavincia, we had acquired at least 10 Sinistee Chips. With these, we can make a trade with this gentleman right here to get ourselves a set of malicious armor. Giving this to the Charconet causes it to evolve into my favorite Pokemon of Generation 9, Severledge. And with this Pokemon on my team, nothing can stand in my way. Okay, now nothing can stand in my way. Thank God these Nimona fights are not necessary wins. But before we can take on the next gym, we have to take part in its gym test, known as the Sunflora, Hide Your Frame Rate, and Seek. After making it through the slideshow known as Arizon, it was time to take on Brassius, and all I can say is this. Heat Wave. Thanks to this move, Brassius' team goes down easily to earn us the second to the last gym badge of the journey. Now that it's daytime, it's finally time to evolve Eevee into Espeon to take on the final gym of the challenge. Who would have guessed though that the real challenge here would be rolling an olive into a net? Honestly, this is why I don't play Rocket League. I'm pretty sure that if there's a practice mode in this game and I'm not sure if there is or not, I would probably just lose it by scoring on myself. Despite Espeon being weak to bug, Elsa has the super effective confusion in his arsenal, which makes quick work of Katie's nimble on turn 1. Tarantula is able to withstand the shot, but only gets off a bug bite for decent damage before the power of telekinesis brings it to its knees. Ooh. Last up is Teddy Ursa, who Katie terrestrializes into a bug type, and this could actually be quite dangerous if Fury Cutter actually lands. But instead, Confusion confuses the bug type, which then hits itself in Confusion before one last Confusion takes it down. Wow, that was confusing. With all of the gym badges out of the way, we have a long way to go before our team's ready to take on the Elite Four. I head back up north to take on many more Chansey, and during the process, Gumi evolves into Sligu, but now we're stuck waiting for some rain before we can actually evolve into Gudra. After about another hour or so of grinding levels, there was still no rain, so I decided to just move on in the meantime. Upon arrival at Castle Royal Lake, I figured I would take on the False Dragon Titan yet again. This time things go much better as Spiritomb gets off a curse on turn 1, and Swalot manages to poison it soon after. After taking out Dondozo a couple times, we're actually introduced to the real and most frightening titan of them all. <laughs> after turning this fish into sushi, we've unlocked the final climbing ability from Rhydon, who's nearly back at its full strength. From there, it was back to looking for more rain. I traveled to the northeast, the southwest, the northwest, and I even tried looking in the desert, but no rain. I literally spent 6 of my 27 in-game hours just looking for rain. I give up. I can't do it anymore. I'm just going to take on the Elite 4 and just hope for the best. Anyone that has played these games is likely familiar with how this goes. The first task is completing an entrance exam put on by Rika herself. Right out of the gates, she comes out with one of the most difficult questions of them all. Which type was your starter? Are you kidding me? This was literally over 26 hours ago and I used it for like maybe 10 minutes. But then I remembered. Who could forget those fiery hot cheeks and that fancy sombrero? Wait, oh, yeah that's right, I chose the duck. Nailed it. Rika specializes in ground types, so I lead off with Sligu, who should have been Gudra by now, but so be it. Whiskash manages to land the blizzard for some decent damage, but Sligu is able to take it out thanks to the power of Ice Beam. So long as we don't miss any attacks going forward, there should be a pretty good chance that we actually... I hate this game. With Sligu gone, I send out Miss Magius instead, which thanks to its levitate ability is immune to Earthquake. But you know what it's not immune to? Rocks. As Miss Magius goes down, I begin to panic and send out Espeon instead, who thankfully just drops Domfan with a single Psychic. Thanks to his high base special attack and defense, Doug Trio and Camera up to go down easily without dealing much damage in return. Then comes Rika's final Pokemon, the one Pokemon that all men fear. Thankfully, despite Espeon going down, I still have Corviknight remaining, and thanks to his flying typing, it cannot be hit by ground moves. A couple drill pecks takes out the ball of mud to earn us the first victory of the Elite Four. Child's play with Poppy is up next, and her team revolves around steel types. This is where my boy Severlidge comes out to play. After getting off two straight sword stances, Purple Cloak's signature move, Bitter Blade, has more than enough power to drop Kuparaja, Bronzong, Corviknight, Magnezo- <clears throat> Magnazone and Tikitung with a single shot each. Up next is Larry, who like Koga in Generation 2, says screw my original team as he ditches all of his normal type Pokemon for the flying types instead. 
He leads off with Tropius, who's the perfect target to allow me to set up with the same strategy as last time. After giving my attack to plus 4, Bitterblade is again able to wipe through his entire team with ease. Purple Cloak here is a beast. And as Larry goes down, Hassel is out next. And I figure, why fix what isn't broken? Am I right? He leads off with Noivern, who is the perfect target to set up Swords Dance against since its Dragon Pulse does next to nothing to Sacrilege. This allows us to get the plus 6 attack, at which point we can drop Noivern with a single shot, restoring most of our HP along the way. Dragology 2 goes down to a single shot, but Haxorus is able to outspeed us and lands a super effective crunch for some huge damage, while also dropping our defense in the process. Not expecting this, I just went for Night Slash, which still takes it out but does not recover HP this time around. This means that if Flapple old speeds, Several Edge is toast, but that is not the case as another Bitter Blade takes it out. All that remains now is Bax Caliber, and as long as I can outspeed, I should be able to easily- Oh boy. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit unprepared for this. I didn't know what to do next, so I just send out Glitter, hoping that Static can activate just in case. But instead, it just drops the Ice Dragon with a single Dazzling Gleam to earn us the final victory of the Elite Four. Nice. With all these fools out of the way, there is only one last battle remaining before we can truly call ourselves a champ. It's time to take on Gita. I even arrive with all my Pokemon still below the level cap of 62, which is even more satisfying in the end. She leads with Espartha, and what do you know, I leave with Sarah yet again. I immediately begin the Swords Dance. Well wait, what's this? Thanks to the Opportunist ability, Espartha too gains a boost to its attack. So after surviving a shot from Night Slash, Lumina Crash lands to deal some devastating damage before one more Night Slash takes it out. Avalug is out next, but with Bitter Blade on my side, this one should be- Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that a giant iceberg is faster than my flaming knight? That's Pokemon logic right there. Out comes Miss Magius instead, who somehow outspeeds to land Mystical Fire and take it out with a single shot. King Gambit, probably my second favorite Pokemon of this generation, is out next, and decimates Miss Magius with a single blow from his signature move, Catal Cleave. Then comes out Corviknight, who is only able to deal minimal damage with Drill Peck before 2 going down. Not knowing what else to do, I just send out Ampharos and go for Thunderbolt, which actually lands and takes it out. Ampharos is holding that metronome item again, so if I keep using Thunderbolt, it should really increase its power. Gita then sends out Go Goat, and it and Ampharos go back and forth exchanging Thunderbolt for Horn Leech, until Ampharos finally comes out on top. Veluza is out next, and thanks to all that speed EV training that I did earlier, Ampharos is able to outspeed this fish out of the water and one-shots it with a super effective Thunderbolt. Gita's signature Pokemon, Glamora, is now all that remains. She terrestrializes it into a rock type, but well, this makes no difference as Ampharos again outspeeds and lands a metronome boosted Thunderbolt to drop the stone flower with just a single shot. As it goes down, we claim our spot as the champion of the region. Or I guess it would be the co-champion. Or the co-co-champion. Why are there three champions? What kind of BS is this? After getting bullied into agreeing to another fight with Nimona, I head back to the lab on Poco Path, where I meet up with Arvin one last time. After spending numerous hours restoring a sick hound back to health, he challenges me to a battle where I have no other option but to put his dog back in its rightful place. Six feet underground. You made me do this. That poor dog. Do you remember all the good times that we had? Oh my god, it's finally raining. With the Path of Legends complete, it was now time to make our way to Area Zero. Wait, why can't I enter? What was that that Arvin said again? Wait, that's it. Penny, your friends are stupid. Come with me. One friend down, only one more to go. And as much as I don't want to, it's time to take on Nimona for one last time. Lycan Rock is out first, and just like many of my previous battles, I figured I would just stick with the Swords Dance strategy since it seems to... On second thought, now is the perfect time to test out a new strategy. Go Gudra! Finally, it feels so good to say that. Gudra is able to take out the Rock Doggo, but not before it gets off his Stealth Rock, which will be dealing damage anytime I switch Pokemon out. As the Dunsparce comes out, I make the big brain move to switch into Miss Magius to counter its normal typing. Turns out that the Dunsparce has Dragon Rush, which annihilates Miss Magius almost instantly. Did I say big brain? I meant 1 IQ. That's my bad. Espeon is able to drop the 3 segmented beast with a single psychic, along with the electric roll that was out next. Then out comes everyone's favorite phallic creature. After doing a bit of switching around, I finally settle on Ampharos, hoping that I can get a static activation again but it just outspeeds and drops the middle worm with a single thunder. Again, nice. Out next is, are you mocking me lady? To just add salt to the wound, Ampharos and Gudra just exchange blows until Ampharos is eventually left with just a single HP to spare before Dazzling Gleam finally takes it out. Skeledurge is now all that remains. After replacing his sombrero with an even more ridiculous looking sombrero, Dazzling Gleam does next to nothing. So down goes Ampharos, who doesn't even manage to get off a static activation either. 
Out comes a Gudra of my own who lands in Muddy Water to drop its accuracy, but Shadow Ball still lands and takes it out. Espeon is now my only hope. With sharp stones digging into its side, it manages to squeeze out one last sidekick, but that was all that's needed. The fire croc falls for one last time. As yet another challenge comes to an end, there is one last mission that we need to take on. The true final test is about to begin. After gathering all of our friends to the rim of the Pelia Crater, we make our way deep into the heart of Area Zero. It is here that we come across the creatures of our nightmares known as the Paradox Pokemon, who were brought to this time thanks to Professor Turo's time machine. These are not the reason why we're here though. Nope, it turns out that the true professor actually died in an accident, so now it's up to us to save the world, yet again. Who would have guessed? At last, it was time for the penultimate battle to begin. Professor Turo's team consists of Paradox Pokemon with a huge spectrum of type coverage. Each of these Pokemon represent a modern day counterpart, but their typings differ significantly. Iron Moth is out first, which can't do much damage to Cyrilage, so I take the time to set up Swords Dance until we're at plus 6 attack. One last discharge from the Moth paralyzes us before Bitter Blade takes it out. Despite having this huge boost in attack, we might not be able to outspeed thanks to Paralysis. So Cyrilage is basically just a sitting duck at this point. Iron Thrones takes full advantage of this by dropping it with a single Stone Edge on the next turn. In a bit of a panic, I send out Gudra, who actually gets off a couple of Surfs to take it down, but also takes huge damage from Stone Edge in the process. As Iron Bundle comes out, I choose to switch into Ampharos as it just goes for a Snowscape instead. I then begin to stack Thunderbolts, hoping to take advantage of the Metronome item, but the False Deli Bird just decides to go for a Snowscape again. Okay. One more Thunderbolt takes it out, along with the Iron Jugulus that was out next. But as Iron Hands comes out, I instead switch into Miss Magius, whose Phantom Force does a lot less damage than I was expecting. I then send out Espeon, who takes huge damage from Thunder Punch, before dropping the Mechanical Massager with a Psychic. This leaves Turo with one last Pokemon remaining. Out comes Iron Valiant, and its booster energy activates. And with that, I knew I was in for a wild ride. Without being able to outspeed, Spirit Break evaporates Espeon. Yeah, this thing is fast. Like, super fast. So I send out Ampharos, hoping that all those speed EVs come in clutch here. But no, it still outspeeds and lands a Spear Break yet again. But Ampharos holds on with a single HP to spare. Alright Glitter, show what you got. Thunder! Oh boy, wait, Glitter, you've done it! With that paralysis, we are now able to outspeed and we're back in the game. Gudra and Miss Magius both stood no chance, but we have one last ace up our sleeve. Purpius, the reliable partner, the one that's been with me from the beginning, deals the final blow to finally end our misery. You've done it my old friend, it's over. Or is it? It turns out that the professor had one last trick up his sleeve. Without being able to call upon any Pokemon of my own, we resort to one last purple Pokemon for our journey. After all this time by our side, or I guess underneath us, it was finally Maridon's time to shine. No matter how many times he got smacked around, and trust me, it was a lot, like a lot, a lot, I still refuse to Trastalize and I'm going to finish this run using my rule set. Finally, after numerous hits and stat buffs, one last Electro Drift finishes it off, setting the Professor free and finally putting an end to this journey. That was brutal. Through all the tough fights, strategizing, and grinding, whoever would have thought that finding some freaking rain would be the toughest part of this whole journey? I mean, come on, I literally checked everywhere. That is why this is the worst game ever made. <laughs> oh, dude, we really need to lay off that Urban Mystica stuff. Well that's going to do for today's video, please smash that subscribe button on your way out and check out more videos on the channel while you're here. But until next time, have a good night and I'll catch you on the next one.